For more on the implications and an update on the situation in Brazil, we're joined by Fred Kemp, president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Fred, what are you watching? It's great to see you again. Uh, great to see you, Kelly. Uh, uh, well, I'm I'm really watching. Uh, you know, there is a change of globalization. Some people talk about it as deglobalization, but it's just really a changing of supply chains. And and what Janet Yellen, Secretary of Treasury, said at the Atlantic Council was friend shoring or near shoring. Well, that makes Mexico a lot more important. Uh, and so last year, a lot of Americans don't actually realize this, but last year, America passed China as the number one trading partner of the United States. Uh, they have a lot of manuf manufacturing capability around automobiles. And the real question is, can we fix immigration systems? Can we fix some of the violence in, in Mexico or help? Uh, uh, can they build some of the infrastructure that China has so that this uh, story of U.S.-Mexican trade and obviously Canada as well, this is going to be a North American Leader Summit, uh, can be one of the great success stories. We, ju we just don't concentrate enough on our own region and our own neighbors. So this is this could be a good news story. So let's talk a little bit about immigration. The president yesterday going to the border for, shockingly to me, the first time uh, during his presidency. Uh, is there a solution there that, that you see, Fred, that can be worked out? What, and if so, what is it? Well, that, that's a really good question, and the answer is there is no simple solution, but there has to be something that moves things uh, uh, further along from where they are right now. Uh, we're told at 6 p.m. Uh, the president is going to be meeting with uh, President uh, Lo uh, Lopez Obrador of Mexico, and top on the Mexican president's list is going to be a discussion of uh, taking on the root causes of migration, and that, of course, is economic development, it's creating jobs. Uh, it, to a certain extent, it's also uh, it's also a uh, criminal uh, crackdown. The Mexicans seem to be willing to take more returns of immigrants. And so I think it's being, you know, we have a 1.6 million person backlog with immigrants. And so a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people are crossing the border because they think that it's going to take so long for them to be processed that they're going to end up being American residents. So the president wants to fix that part of it bring in more people who are truly under threat from Venezuela, from Haiti, from Cuba, and, and be able to turn back the people that are not legitimate. Uh, Do we legitimate know, Fred, I, I, and I, forgive me for not knowing, I should know this, the percentage roughly of those people who are coming across the southern border who are Mexican as opposed to Nicaraguan, Venezuelan, Honduran, Salvadoran? Well, the, the great growth, I don't know the actual percentages, but the growth has not been of Mexicans. That's what I the thought. Growth, the growth has been with Cubans and Venezuelans and Haitians and Nicaraguans. Uh, that is where the largest numbers of growth have come from and not, not from Mexicans themselves. Fred, also curious, as we're talking about how we didn't have this summit even during the Trump years and this trend of friend shoring that you said Yellen is talking about, and that, that's quite a loaded term. We also have this rising nationalism in Brazil. I mean, put this into bigger context for us. How could that complicate efforts if it would? Um, as you know, what I mean? are there dominoes to connect here or not? Uh, well, Brazil, I find it absolutely fascinating because there is no doubt that there are some connections, uh, uh, even copycat connections to January 6th. And then online, online groups, nationalist right-wing groups speak to each other. They egg each other on. So there are those connections. But then in Brazil, there's a very local connection, which is they have their own divisions. And um, uh, and and what was different is uh, when the Congress was uh, attacked on January 6th in the United States, the members of Congress were actually there, and it was limited to the Congress. In uh, Brazil, it was a number of different institutions and uh, and and it was on the weekend. The members were not there. What's interesting in Brazil is there were so many tip-offs. There's so many signs uh, that one could have taken preventative action against this, and why didn't that happen? So I think what you'll see is uh, is this playing out. Just very briefly, I think what it underscores is when you have economic difficulties, when you have economic dislocation, you're going to have. Uh, populism from the left and populism from the right. Mm -hmm. And right now in Latin America, you're getting a lot of both. So I don't think this is going to be restricted just to I think result. it's curious and not by accident that uh, Jair Bolsonaro was not in Brazil, but rather was in Miami or in Florida somewhere uh, when this happened. And I hear the same with respect to the uh, person who's in charge of the justice 
um, sort of ministry in the area where Brasilia is located. That individual, the person in charge of security, uh, was absent as well, as though to say, you know, hey, I had nothing to do with this. I wasn't even there. Well, I, I mean, I, as you know, in my previous existence, I was a Wall Street Journal editor, and I would have my reporters out reporting all of what you just said much more deeply. I think there's a there's a TikTok around this. A TikTok is a reconstruction yeah. of what happened, where I think we need to learn a lot more. And uh, and I think one of the questions is going to be, you know, what are these individuals doing in the United States? What connections right. do they have? What Americans? Uh, and what connections are there uh, online with all of these groups? I think that's really rich area for reporting. And